Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 30. My name is Andy. Uh, we're in the middle of module D. We're, um, we've been learning about trait objects and object safety for traits, but we're moving on now to design patterns in Rust. Things to do that make, tend to make your code good. Uh, things not to do as well. We'll, we'll get on to that tend to be maybe traps. All right. So why should we le learn design patterns? Um, sometimes you hit on a problem that is similar to a problem that someone else has solved in the past. And so there are, they've did, found good patterns or you've found good patterns that you want to follow. So, uh, design patterns are just someone writing those things down, um, that might help you, um, A, it might help you find a good solution, but B, it might help other people reading your code, um, recognize what you've done and, and immediately have ways of thinking about it without having to kind of start from scratch on every new piece of code. So it can be useful. Um, if it doesn't fit your problem, don't use it. Um, uh, don't treat it like a religion because some design patterns in the past have, have led to like whole ways of thinking that I now think are not so good. So, you know, um, use where it's helpful and it fits. All right. So here are some, here are the patterns we're going to look at. We're going to, uh, look at the new type pattern, the RAII pattern, um, the type state pattern and the strategy pattern. I'll just talk about what they are, have a look at an example of when you might use them. Okay, so the new type pattern. Um, this is a very little thing, like it's, it's, got, it's a posh name for a small thing. So um, here's an example. Um, so this is a struct called IMEI, which is like uh, the special number that isn't your phone number, but it kind of uniquely identifies your SIM card or your phone number or something. Um, it doesn't matter. What matters is it's... Um, the contents of an IMEI in this representation is just a string. So why wouldn't you just pass around a string in your program? Well, it turns out there's quite an advantage to doing this kind of struct, which um, it consists of just a string, right? That's, that's what this syntax means. It might be slightly unfamiliar because you might be used to curly brackets in your, your structs, but it's actually completely valid for a struct to be essentially a tuple of size one, which is just a string. So it's just one thing in, it, in this IMEI struct, which is a string. You get to it, by the way, by saying self.0, like it's like, cause it's like a tuple. It's like the first thing in, in my tuple, cause it's only one thing. Um, so why, what's, what's the use of wrapping this up and saying, when I talk about IMEIs, I want to talk about IMEIs, not strings. Well, I mean, I've slightly started to answer just by saying that, right? It's, it's clearer when you're reading the code, if you can see that someone's passed in an IMEI, what they mean by it, instead of a string where, you have to rely on the name of the parameter or something to figure out what, what type of thing it is. So let's have a look at how this would be used. Um, so uh, the way they've implemented it here, when in the impl block of IMEI, there is a function called validate, which takes in a str, which is like a sort of a candidate for an IMEI, and it either returns like a unit to say, yes, that, that will work as an IMEI, uh, or it returns an error saying that's... That, that string is, doesn't match my expectations for an IMEI. And I haven't actually implemented the validate function, but you can see it's like checking that this string could, could be turned into an IMEI. Uh, and then they've, they've implemented the try from string, uh, trait for an IMEI. And, uh, so they've got this try from method, which is part of that trait, um, which either returns an IMEI, that's what self is, or it returns an error, which is this validate error. Uh, error. So basically what we're saying is um, there's a way of converting from a string into an IMEI which does the validation and if the validation um, passes, you know, works, then we return this IMEI object, this struct, which is just a string underneath, but now we know it's a string which is a valid IMEI because we did our validation, or it returns an error saying it failed. So now we cannot just say like my code is clearer because whenever I call, whenever I write a function that takes in an IMEI, I say IMEI instead of string here. Um, but more than that, we can also say um, you, you can't make an IMEI without first validating it and then... Um, so we know that it's not just a string. We know it's a string that's in the right format. Um, and an example of this that happens in normal Rust is that when you have a string, you know it's actually valid UTF-8 because the, the same kind of pattern is happening here. Underneath a string is just like a vec of bytes, right, of U8s. 
um, which is not actually technically a VEC, but you know, it's like a uh, contiguous chunk of uh, bytes, but they've also been checked that they're valid UTF-8. So this IMEI is doing a similar pattern to that. It's checking it's a valid IMEI before it um, lets you create one. Now, I might do this slightly differently. I might, instead of this try from, um, which is probably, maybe it's good because it's like a, it's a standard Rust pattern to use the try from trait. Um, but um, there's also like, and, and, and as long as this is the only kind of public way of making an IMEI, then it works. I might just, I would feel like it might be clearer to me if I just made a constructor on IMEI, which also returned result like this. Um, and then, and I would call like IMEI colon colon new or something to make one. But then I'd have to check whether it, it worked because it would actually validate inside. Um, and I, why would I do that? Because I wouldn't think to do it, to try and do try into or something on a string to turn it into an IMEI. Um, I would be looking for a constructor on IMEI, but it would work exactly the same way as this. Maybe this is a more um, idiomatic pattern, probably. Anyway, um, whoops, when is new type useful? Um, well, enforcing input validation is the thing we've already looked at, um, and allowing for semantic typing, which is kind of the same um, idea. Well, it's not, well, it's not just, okay, yeah, so semantic typing is more than just input validation. It's also saying um, if someone has, say, a URL, they can't accidentally use it as an IMEI or vice versa, right? Um, the um, semantic typing means this new type pattern means that it is actually, the reason why it's called a new type pattern is because IMEI is a different type from string and a different type from URL or anything else that wraps a string. So you can't accidentally use one thing as another thing. Um, so a place where that might be helpful is in, uh, if you're doing some kind of physics simulation, um, you might have different units as new types. So you might say kilograms, a uh, different uh, type from centimeters, and then you couldn't accidentally pass in the weight of something and have it interpreted as a length. Um, so that's um, semantic typing. And then also the orphan rule, which we did talk about, but you may have forgotten because we only talked about it briefly, um, which is that you can't... If you're implementing a trait, either the trait or the structure you're implementing it for need to be in this crate. If you've got a struct in some other crate and a trait in some other crate, none of neither of which kind of belong to you, and you want something which impels, which is that struct and implement implements that trait, what you need to do is wrap that struct in a new type, and now you own the wrapper, and now you can implement. The, the trait on your new type. So that's the kind of way of working around the orphan rule. Um, the reason that's okay is because no one could confuse that with um, someone else who'd done the same thing in their crate because they would have wrapped it with a different wrapper. So it would all work. All right, so that was the new type pattern, very simple. Uh, now let's talk about the RAII guard pattern, which is um, a very posh name for a very simple idea. Um, blame You should blame probably blame C++ for this, their posh name. Okay, so RAII stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. Um, but all that really means is when I acquire a resource, for example, I open a file or um, I take a lock or something like that, um, that, that creation of that resource or kind of getting hold of that resource um, is the same as creating a new object, new struct or something in my code. Um, in fact, yeah, it definitely will be a struct, I guess. No, well, anyway, a new thing, like a struct or an enum, a new object in my code. When I create that, that is when I'm acquiring the resource. It's the same thing. Now, that's a confusing way to talk about it because actually what's interesting about RAII is not when you acquire the resource, it's when you release the resource. So actually, it should be called something like resource releasing is destruction or something like that. Anyway, um, so the point is, when that when that struct or object gets dropped in Rust terminology or destructed in C++ terminology, um, then the resource gets released automatically. So the reason why this is cool is that you can't forget to drop your thing, right? If you've if you're if you've constructed this thing in the normal kind of scope in in your Rust code it will get dropped at the end of that block if you've just created it on the stack there. So you can't forget it. Even if you return early 
or something unexpected happens, whenever that um, you leave that scope, that that resource guard, that thing that kind of holds onto the resource for you, will get dropped. And that means it will get freed up. You won't forget to close the file, try and use it later, and actually your edits will get mixed in with the old ones or there'll be an error because someone's already got the file open, that kind of thing. Um, so where you need to kind of guarantee that you're going to let go of something, like especially important for locks, right? If you take a lock on something, you can't, if you forget to unlock it, then everything's messed up because no one else can take the lock. Um, if you forget, uh, so yeah, if you wrap it up in an RAII pattern, like for example, the built-in mutex type in Rust, then there's no chance of you forgetting to release it. Um, and then the other part of Rust, which um, is a really nice part of this pattern in Rust, is that you can actually, um, when you take, uh, when you actually use the thing, you use it through that object that you've created that, that wraps it. So it's kind of a natural, it feels very natural in Rust in a way it doesn't in other, like in other languages, you might take a lock. You might even use some kind of defer keyword or something to guarantee that you're going to release that lock. Um, but you don't talk about the, thing inside the lock by using the, the lock object, whereas in Rust you do. Um, this is far too many words. So um, uh, here's an example of a database transaction object. So um, we don't have any code that uses, we don't have an example code that uses this code. We've only got the code that you would use. So imagine you're writing code and you create a transaction object because you're, um, you're connected to a database already. You've got this connection. Um, and you want to start a transaction, which means um, uh, all of your the whole batch of operations you're going to do in this database could, will get undone if you if something goes wrong. And so the definition of something going wrong is that you never said that you did you never call this commit method. So you do you begin the transaction, um, and uh, that returns yeah that returns a transaction object when you call begin so you begin the transaction with the connection you've already got it sets it up saying they didn't call commit yet and some other stuff then you you, you call various queries you know you do some stuff on, in the database do some work and then you call commit and when you call commit um, then did commit was set to true and that's all that happens here and then you just wait for the transaction to get um, the transaction object to get dropped, which will happen when when it trans when it goes out of scope. When it goes out of scope, um, this is the point I was saying about like destruction is the key part, right? Because it's what happens in the drop method that's interesting. So in the drop method, it checks did did they call commit? If so, call commit on the actual database. Otherwise, roll back the database. So the whole point is um, you can't leave this transaction hanging of like um, of partly done. It's guaranteed that drop will get called. And drop will either actually send a commit message to the real database or it will send a rollback message to the real database saying undo all these changes that someone did. So now if you're writing code in your Rust code, you make this transaction, you begin it, you start making queries, and then you return early because there was an error. Then your transaction object will get dropped and it will automatically roll back. It will tell the database undo all those things that I did. Uh, and otherwise, if you if everything goes well and you call commit at the end of your function, then when the transaction goes out of scope and gets dropped, um, then it will send a commit message to your database. So what this means is that um, you can't leave your function with the, with the transaction still open. It will definitely be closed either by committing it or rolling it back. So you, you've guaranteed yourself against a pro like a programming mistake of forgetting to finish off that transaction in one way or the other. And it also means you can write really convenient code, right? You can use the question mark operator knowing that that means actually roll back the transaction because the transaction will get dropped without you having committed it. So it could be a nice way to use databases. Um, yeah, so why, when would you use RAII? Well, you're going to find yourself using a lot of code that other people wrote that is RAII, like mutex or um, file, say. Um, uh, so, or rather, it's, yeah, it's the RAI, it's the, it's the mutex guard object, which comes back from a mutex, which is actually the kind of RAI object in that case. It, it, it releases the lock when it gets destroyed. Um, yeah, so, um, you're going to end up using lots of code written by other people that is RAII. But yeah, if you have some resource that you need to, if you need to anything that needs, you need to guarantee happens, think about whether it should live in the drop implementation of some kind of guard object like this. Um, and that means that um, 
Yeah, that means that you can guarantee something's going to happen. And one of the places where you might want to guarantee that something's going to happen is that you need to make sure that an invariant holds while that guard object is alive, and then and once it gets dest destroyed, yeah, you're no longer kind of enforcing that invariant. So that's some places where RAII RAI, RAI might be useful. Let's talk about the type state pattern. This is about encoding the state of an object in its type. So you would normally encode the state of an object in like some um, some property of that object. You know, like it's either it's either in state one, two, three, or four, right? So you'd store it in a number. Um, and this is talking about storing the, the the state of an object in its type. So um, what you do here is you'd make some types like ready, which by the way can't be instantiated. You can't you can't create uh, an instance of ready because it's an enum with no variants, which is weird. But it means that it's a type that no one can create an instance of. So why would you do that? Um, well, we'll talk in a minute about this phantom data thing. But basically, um, you you make your actual type, which does stuff have a, a generic type parameter um, and ready is going to be one of the things that could, you could put in there. So that was the point of ready. And then for, e for each um, possible state that you're going to have, um, your impl block um, says impl my thing and then generic on, on that ready or some other uninitializable type and you put the methods in there that are relevant to the ready state only so it's going to make much more sense if we look at the example um, and then yeah when you update the state you return a new instance of yourself but with the generic type parameter that is the different state so this is going to be much easier if we look at the example so here are the possible states of a coffee machine it could be idle an item could have been selected or money could have been inserted those are the three things that a coffee machine could be so then we define a coffee machine and it probably will have other data, but it also is going to have this underscore state property, which is not really used for anything, and it's of type phantom data, so that's confusing. We'll talk about it. Um, but yeah, coffee machine is has this type parameter of S, and S is expected to be one of these three idle items selected or money inserted. And maybe you could enforce that with a trait or something, not sure. Um, but yeah, and, and so... Um, yeah, and then you have some normal implementation of coffee machine where we're doing impl and then we've got a type parameter um, and then we're passing that type parameter onto coffee machine. Uh, and that imp that we provide like a method there, which is basically like um, to change the state of my coffee machine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is just a convenience method that says if I've got a coffee machine... If I am a coffee machine of type NS, as in some previous state, no, sorry. If I am a, if I am a coffee machine of type CS, that's my previous state, and I call into state with a different type, then I'll get back a coffee machine in that new state, right? So this is new state, and this is, I mean, coffee machine state, I guess CS is. Um, and all that does is returns, like myself, because this takes a, this, like, uses up self, and returns a new coffee machine with the new type. Like, it, it, it figures it out from the return type that this is going to be a coffee machine NS. So we don't have to explicitly put it anywhere. Um, so basically, that's a way of saying, change my state from this into this. And this might be, possibly this might be a private function so that people outside of this module can't use it. And then the interesting stuff happens here. So um, you, you've got various impl blocks which are uh, implementations of coffee machine, which only refer, which only apply to a coffee machine if it's in a particular state. So if coffee machine is in an idle state, then it has a new, or rather, not even that. In order to make a coffee machine with an idle state, which is what this self is, then you call coffee machine new, and it will return. It will it, because this this impl block has this idle here. <coughs> um, then new is going to return a coffee machine of type in state idle, right? So. Um, we, when you're using a coffee machine, in order to create one, you need to call new. But the only new that you've got is this new that, that is in the idle block. So you, if you call new, you're going to get back an idle coffee machine, which makes sense, right? You start when when a coffee machine first exists, it's idle. And now, 
we've got um, more stuff that's implemented only for the idle state. So if you've got a coffee machine in idle state, this could have been in the same block, by the way, but it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of nice to see these three blocks kind of next to each other. Do you, did you remember, by the way, that you can have du duplicate input blocks like this? You can. Anyway, if a coffee machine is in an idle state, it only, there's only one method you can call on it, which is select item. And when you call select item, you get back a coffee machine in the item selected state. And then the implementation of this uses into state, right? So that's where we might be. This slightly confusing method, the reason why it's, it's done is because it's used here. So we could have just actually returned coffee machine or something like that, and it would have known. The point is, if you do some stuff with coffee, a coffee machine that's in idle state, you select an item, you now get back a coffee machine, which is in the item selected state. So the point is, when you made that coffee machine new, it only had one method, which was select item, because it was in idle state. And then if you, if you, now, if you now have a coffee machine that's in item selected state, because you called select item, you don't have a select item method anymore, because the select item method was only defined for coffee machines in idle state. So now you've got a coffee machine in item selected state. Um, you, so now you only have one method, which is insert money. And if you insert the money into the coffee machine, then you get back a coffee machine in state money inserted. And now you don't have an insert money method anymore. You only have a make beverage method because now you have a coffee machine in money inserted state. Um, and now it's going to go back to idle when you call make beverage. So maybe this is a silly example, but the point is you don't have a variable here which tells you, tells you your coffee machine is in idle state. Um, if you had that, then inside the say insert money method, you'd have a check in there saying, um, if the coffee machine is in idle state, you're not allowed to insert money into it. Um, and then it would have to throw or, you know, like return some kind of error or something like that and say, you weren't allowed to call this method. But because of the, um, because we're doing this at the type level, um, it's impossible to call the insert money method on something in an idle state because it's just not defined inside the idle state's input block. So what this means is that the compiler can check for you that your code follows the logic that needs to be followed to use a coffee machine. So in situations where you've got something which changes into different states, um, and it, it should, there's different things you can do to it when it's in different states, this can be a way of doing it. And there is another pattern you can follow which um, might be more natural, which is um, instead of having one object called coffee machine, which has these different states... You could actually have multiple objects called like idle coffee machine, item selected coffee machine, and money inserted coffee machine, and just have methods on idle coffee machine, like select item, which returns an item selected coffee machine. And you might find that easier. Either way, it's the same um, idea that you're encoding what could possibly happen to this thing because of its state in the type of the object instead of in some variable inside the object. So it can be useful if that was confusing, uh, don't worry about it too much. Like, it, 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 if you see it in practice, it might make more sense. Um, yeah, so when should you use the type state pattern? Well, if your problem is some kind of state machine, as in, like, the, the state of your thing changes and you can do different stuff with it based on what state it's in. By the way, if some of those methods overlap, that's okay. Like, either they'll be apply to everything, in which case you can implement them in that first input block, which allowed any any kind of type. Um, or you could just implement them multiple times in the different things. If you wanted to share code, like call a shared function or something. Um, but yeah, the point of this is it ensures that compile time that you can't do stuff that doesn't make sense because of the state of your thing. So it could be useful. Uh, let's also talk about the strategy pattern, which is something that is more familiar from kind of object-oriented programming. So let's have see, let's see how you can make that work in Rust. Um, so how does the strategy pattern work? Well, it, um, it allows you to represent like the different variants of how to do a thing as different objects. Uh, and then you can interchange them. So if you're, if you know about something that, that knows how to frugal, um, then there could be lots of things that know how to frugal. Um, and you could use code. You can write code that, 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 that frugal stuff without knowing what, uh, what underneath what frugaling actually means. So let's look at an example. It'll make more sense. Um, yeah, and then you could basically different ways of the different styles of frudling can be somehow chosen based on like um, user input or something. So here's our example. 
we've got a trait which is a payment strategy. Essentially, some, it knows how to pay. So when I was saying Foodle earlier, it, the, the example here is pay. So anything that implements the payment strategy trait knows how to pay. And then you've got um, different ways of paying. So a cash payment knows how to pay by like handing over cash. And a card payment knows how to pay by bleeping their card. And then when you're using this code, you basically pick... Um, so like say the user typed in like wh whether I want to use card or cash. And then we pick a payment strategy um, by by like checking whether the user said card or cash. If they said card, we return a reference to a card payment. Uh, and if they said cash, we return a reference to a cash payment. So strategy is one of these trait objects, right? This is a DIN payment strategy, which is why it needs to be a reference or a box or something. It needs to be a pointer type because strategy, we don't know how much space to set aside for strategy because it might be different sizes based on card payment or cash payment being different sizes. Um, but it's okay. We know the size of a reference to it um, because that's just that data plus V table thing we were looking at last last time and the time before. Um, so we've got a trait object uh, in strategy, which means we know we don't know what type it is, but we know that it has a pay method because it's on in payment strategy. So we can write code, and here we've only got one line of code, but you could have like tons and tons of code that um, that pays for loads of different things, um, and it doesn't have to know whether you're using card or cash to pay. It just knows how to pay. Um, so that's like you know a classic object oriented way of like. Um, kind of encapsulating how you pay so that it doesn't need to worry the code that does the paying. All right, so uh, when would you use this? Well, basically when you want to do something different based on some runtime thing that's happening, like for, like the example we had. Uh, so can be useful if you have code that, that needs to be able to pay for stuff but doesn't care how you pay, or that kind of thing. All right, so that was... Um, some good ways of structuring code in Rust, some of which more common than others. Like I think you, you should think about um, RAII guards whenever you've got some um, something that you want to kind of make sure happens. And you should use new type patterns wherever you've got something that is uh, where you're tempted to just pass around strings or something. You should think, well, maybe this should be a new type. The others may be less, less common. But anyway, things you shouldn't do. So something you really, really shouldn't do, and might you might see some in some places possibly, although I haven't seen it in the wild, is deref polymorphism. So um, basically, this is um, this is done by someone who wants object-oriented programming with inheritance. Rust doesn't have inheritance, um, so trying to kind of simulate uh, inheritance by using the deref trait. So let's have a look at this. Um, we've got a struct called animal, and the animals have a name, and animals have things they can do. They can walk, eat, and say their name. Um, and we kind of want, we want dogs to kind of inherit this behavior in some way. Uh, so we want, like, basically, if I've got a dog, I want it to be able to walk, say. Um, because that's what, that's how inheritance works in object oriented programming. Um, so, so we've got a dog. It doesn't have a walk method, but we want to be able to call dog.walk on it, which is what we're doing down the bottom here. Um, so what the way that that's the, the way that we kind of hack the system to make that work is that we have provide this deref um, trait. We implement deref for dog. We say if you deref dog, it turns into an animal, um, and we just return like inside dog there is like an animal um, property. And we return that when you when you call when you de when you deref dog, and then because like this dot operation means automatically deref to animal or de automatically call this deref if it exists if the method doesn't exist on the actual dog. So bark exists on the dog, so we'll call it. Um, but walk doesn't exist on the dog, so it will say, okay, can I deref this and then call walk? So this works in the sense that you can call walk on dog. Um, but it's really confusing and not, it's, it, it, it's not doing what, what you were kind of hoping for when you, when you implemented this. It's not doing inheritance. So let's look at why this, why this is a bad idea. Um, so dog is not a subtype of animal. You can't pass a dog in somewhere where you were expecting an animal. Um, and any traits that are implemented on animal are not implemented on dog automatically. Um, and deref and deref mute, uh, the deref uh, trait that we saw, um, it's intended for like a dog is a pointer to an animal, 
right? Which is not what this means at all. Um, and so actually calling that dog converts the dog to an animal. Well, that's like how, what it's supposed to mean. Um, so what does that mean? Like it, 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 like in, in the kind of inheritance paradigm, a dog is an animal. So, um, this, this very weird and, um, yeah, in Rust, we don't, we don't do that kind of implicit conversions. If you want to convert a dog to an animal, you would say you would have a, like an, um, into or, um, as method that would be explicit about it. So yeah, basically, it's not actually doing the object oriented programming thing that it looks like, like a dog is not an animal. Um, and then for Rust programmers, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like it's not, dogs are not pointers to animals. So what should you do? Um, you should stop using inheritance and you should think about things differently. So if you actually need to share code, right, between a dog and a, and a cat, um, then by all means have an animal, like compose your structures, what it says, have an animal, um, or animal characteristics property or something like that. And then have a method that says like dot animal characteristics. And then you can call your methods, your animal methods on that or something like that. Um, and if that's too, um, uh, if that's overcomplicated, well then, then the methods like walk that you want to have on dog, write a method on dog called walk and have it just call the shared code underneath, right? Uh, it's a slightly more typing. Um, I mean, it is more typing, right? And so you might wish that you could do inheritance, but my experience of inheritance is it leads to very confusing and, um, often incorrect code where you've forgotten that you've overloaded some, over, overridden something somewhere. Um, so it causes a lot of pain and I think it's worth the extra typing of, um, the walk method needs to exist on dog so that you can call some underlying shared walk code. Um, yeah. And then stick to explicit conversions. It, like if you want to convert from one type to another, for example, if you want to convert a dog to an animal, um, in the same way that you want to like say, um, treat a string as, um, or uh, treat a vec as a um, a slice of whatever. Um, use the as or uh, as ref or as mute ref. Uh, well, as mute, which means as mutable ref um, traits. Implement those traits, and then you could make it explicitly allowed to convert from one thing to another. Other things you shouldn't do in Rust. Um, you shouldn't force your. If you're writing a library, you shouldn't force your users to do dynamic dispatch. So where possible, you should avoid taking a reference to a din blah. Instead, you should use um, uh, the pattern that we saw last video, where you um, you re you don't require something to be sized, and it, and it can be so. It could be a reference to a din blah, or it could be an actual thing that implements that trait. So basically, use uh, prefer generics, generic functions over functions that require you to pass in a, um, a trait object. Uh, don't just randomly scatter around calls to clone to satisfy the borrow checker. Um, I would sort of caveat that this with, um, it depends what type of code you're writing. Like in general, you should think about why am I needing to call clone here? And is that really right? But, um, as you learn Rust, that's going to take time to learn what, like how to do that thinking and how to understand that stuff. And if a clone makes the borrow checker go away, you should definitely think to yourself, is that actually wrong? Because if I'm, say, modifying it later, it won't modify the real one. It will modify my clone, and that could be bad. So you should still think about it. But if it makes the borrow checker go away, and he's not in a performance-critical bit of code, maybe that's a good compromise for now. But yeah, um, certainly scattering a clone around uh, with no thought at all um, is not good. You don't have to, like, prematurely optimize everything, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um so when you add a clone, just think about whether you really need it or whether actually you should be like passing in a reference to something or, or something like that. Um, and yeah, uh, they're also suggesting don't unwrap or call expect, which is essentially unwrapping with an error message, um, to handle conditions that are recoverable or, or possible. So basically they're saying you should only unwrap or expect if this should ever happen. So it, that, that massively depends on the type of code you're writing, right? If you're writing a command line script, which is just for you and, um, 
uh, there's some there's some error condition like a file doesn't exist or something, then feel free to unwrap or expect probably expect is better, um, and it will generate a fairly messy error message on the command line when you run your program. Um, but it will tell you what went wrong. So that could be fine. But if you're writing like some great um, service that must never go down or something like that, then uh, don't panic unless you, um, unless these things should never happen, I guess. is that That's the kind of usual pattern. Instead of that, you should be using something like the question mark operator or something. You should have a, an error type that represents your, um, like the possible things that could go wrong. And that forces the people calling your, um, function to think about what might go wrong and handle it. Um, yeah. So only panic if it, it should never happen. That's like, that's far too general. And I've given you some caveats. Like that. All right. So just to summarize what we've covered in module D, um, we talked a lot about, um, dynamic dispatch and trait objects and why there are certain rules around what you can do in a trait if it's going to be a trait object. Um, we talked about some design patterns just now. Uh, good ways of writing your Rust code. We talked about some things you shouldn't do in Rust, especially um, don't pretend you've got inheritance by using DREF, because it's just confusing, and it isn't inheritance. Um, uh, there's a link there to more design pattern stuff. Um, uh, ne- thanks for watching. Next time, we will do some exercises that help us think through some of this stuff a little bit more. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, and uh, see you next time. <laughs>